When we are deciding to implement connected care and remote care, the biggest barrier we faced was internally is will patients be able to do this? And when we thought about it, I immediately went to a FaceTime call. Many, many of our patients can do FaceTime calls with their grandkids. So that was the question we started asking. Have you done a FaceTime call? Have you done a video chat with, with your family, with your grandkids? And almost all of our patients said, yes, I have. So that was our introduction, that if you can do a FaceTime call with your grandkids, you can do remote care. And thankfully it has worked very well. And that call, that question gets them in the right mindset that, oh, this is no different than talking to the grandkids on Sunday. I'm just gonna talk to my audiologist instead. When I think about which patients are best suited for remote care, it's pretty much all of my patients. I have yet to have a patient say no. So all of my adult patients in particular, most use their cell phones and are able to really benefit from using remote care and these remote checks. When we first started, um, we were really selective with who we were enrolling, like implant type, recipient type, distance from the clinic, lifestyle. Whereas now we know it can benefit anyone. Like it doesn't matter if you're a busy mom, if you're at school, if you're traveling five hours, if you're five minutes down the road, we have people who use remote care because then they don't have to take public transport. So there's so many reasons for so many different people. We're not always going to know that reason. They're not always going to share it with us. We just know it's going to help them and it's something that we can offer them. So we do. Our approach to enrolling patients for remote care has definitely changed over time. Initially, largely because it was during COVID period and we weren't seeing a lot of patients in the clinic, we would doing it by invitation emails. Then as COVID eased off and there was more inpatient appointments, we were largely enrolling one-on-one uh, -on -one when clinicians had met with patients. And now we're doing a combination of both methods. As we've introduced remote care, one concern that some of us had was how it would change our relationship with the patients and if it would remove some of the personal connection that we had to them and their needs. However, I think that the way I think of it is really it's kind of a tool in our toolbox. It doesn't replace our in-person care. It really complements it. And it's just another way that we can make sure that we're there for them in a way that is convenient. I try my best not to marry any biases into my mind whenever selecting uh, potential patients who may benefit from this tool. We utilize a digital skills assessment that's in our intake paperwork that patients fill out prior to their appointment at the clinic. Questions that are asked in that give us an idea of, has this person used a smartphone recently? Do they know how to send an email? Um, what's their comfort level with technology. So we utilize that information along with our case history, understanding the dynamics in the home. Is this someone who is not tech savvy that's living at home by themselves? Do they potentially have a caregiver or a family member that can support them? How far are they from the clinic? I think it's really important to keep your mind open when considering candidates for uh, remote care. We use our own clinic materials that discuss remote care, as well as the remote care guide that Cochlear provides. It really walks the patients right through what to expect and what remote care can and can't provide for them right now. My patients that aren't as tech savvy typically have someone in the family or a friend that can help them, and I can demo how to use it in the office to make sure that they understand how to do it. The program does not move quickly, so it gives patients reaction time. They can press the screen. It is not quick, and they tend to do uh, very well with this. So my advice to you for selecting like your recipients who you want to onboard for remote care and discuss it with, don't really look any further than your implant type and sound processor type. So obviously make sure that they have the compatible technology and, and then don't make any other assumptions about whether they want to use it or don't want to use it. It will be how you present it and yeah, interact with them and your discussions. For us, that's really made the difference. Like if you come across as believing in it and comfortable, confident, this is what we do now, come into, oh, like maybe there's this thing you might want to try. It really depends on how you as a clinic and a professional present it to the recipient. 
um, for the uptake as well. But don't look any further than the implant and sound processor type. If I can give any advice to any clinics or clinicians, it would be just being open-minded about who can benefit from remote care. Um, the learnings that we've taken at our clinic is it can benefit anybody regardless of what their demographic might be. I would give advice to a new clinic introducing remote care to just be really open to the possibilities of how you might be able to apply it. I think that as audiologists, um, we're experts in hearing care and we, we know a lot, but we don't have the patient perspective and sometimes patients may surprise us in how willing or unwilling they are to use different technologies in different ways.